Uh, good afternoon and welcome to our symposium on the Supreme Court and the public imagination. And our country is really unique, as many of you know, in terms of the, the esteem and the respect that everybody holds or most people hold for the Supreme Court. And this place in this consciousness and the dynamics of that will be the focus of discussions for this afternoon and then for um, tomorrow. And we're delighted that the Institute on the Supreme Court of the United States is hosting this symposium. And there are many centers on the Supreme Court, both in political science departments and in law departments around the country. Some talk about generating new scholarship about the Supreme Court. I'm delighted that my colleagues, including many of them who are here, have been writing about the Supreme Court. Some focus on the oral arguments that are about to be argued. And I know that some, both of our alums and some of our uh, peers, colleagues here, have argued before the Supreme Court as well. But this Institute of the Supreme Court is a little different. It's looking at how the interaction proceeds between members of the public and the Supreme Court. So it takes a look at the court as an institution itself. And so I'm delighted that we were able to bring that particular lens to the proceedings on the next two days. And on a personal note, I want to say that I'm delighted to be up here today because I am now approaching my 29th anniversary of my first uh, oral argument in the appellate court, which of course was before Judge Posner. So we won't, we won't replay it now. Needless to say, I did not get his vote, but I won. But nonetheless, <laughs> I want to wish myself a happy 29th uh, birthday of that occasion. And now you can rest assured because the constitutionality of the consensual reference provisions of the Magistrates Act, 28 U.S.C. 636C, has been uh, safeguarded. So that's the importance. <laughs> Uh, so with that, I'm delighted to introduce the director of ISCOTUS, or the Institute on the Supreme Court, Carolyn Shapiro, who herself has written much about the Supreme Court as an institution. Carolyn. Thank you, Hal. Um, and I'd like to echo your welcome uh, to everyone who's here for the, uh, our symposium on the Supreme Court and the American public, um, including people who've traveled from around the country who I haven't had a chance to say hello to yet, but I look forward to our next 24 hours. Um, I'd like to say a few thank yous to, for, to people who helped put this together. Uh, first, my friend and colleague, Chris Schmidt, um, but also special thanks to other people in the law school, including Tara Anderson and Susan Lures, Tasha Kincaid, and Allison Steiner, Sue Jaden and Jared Steimer, Jerry Goldman and Matt Groon, and the law review editors, uh, Katie Cottle and Cecilia Sue. And of course, because I've listed people, I'm sure I've left someone out um, because many people helped put this, uh, this day together. Uh, before I introduce Judge Posner, I'd like you all to know that you, have, uh, you should have cards on which to write, or we'll be getting cards on which to write questions. Uh, we will be collecting them um, uh, towards the end of the talk. Um, and then we'll have some Q&A afterwards, uh, after, after Judge Posner is done speaking, and then we will have um, a, a reception in the lobby uh, at, after the talk. Now, to the main event. I'm honored to introduce Judge Richard Posner, although it is probably true that he needs no introduction. Uh, Judge Posner is a graduate of Harvard Law School, after which he clerked for Justice Brennan. He worked in government for several years, including with the Federal Trade Commission and the Solicitor General's Office. Um, and he joined the faculty of the University of Chicago Law School in 1969, uh, where he is still a senior lecturer in law. In 1981, President Reagan appointed Judge Posner to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit, where he sits today. He was the chief judge of the court from 1993 to 2000. That's, of course, just the bare bones. Judge Posner is well known not only as an extraordinarily influential and widely cited judge, but also for his extensive non-judicial writing. I actually tried to figure out how many books he's written, but I kept getting different numbers depending on where I went. Um, to, so I'd say at least 40, uh, substantially more if you start counting different editions and uh, various books that he's edited, uh, uh, that, uh, other books that he's edited. And I didn't even try to attempt to count the number of scholarly articles that Judge Posner has produced. Um, his writing also appears in publications such as The New Republic and on the op-ed page of uh, major newspapers, and his interests are extraordinarily wide. He's written about sex, aging, obesity, the 2000 election, the Clinton impeachment, the financial crisis, and sometimes also about the law. <laughs> um, I believe that Judge Posner thinks the best way to learn about a subject is to write a book about it. Uh, Judge Posner gave me my first job out of law school. I was incredibly privileged to work as his law clerk for a year. One of the many pleasures of working for him was disagreeing with him. 
Um, in other words, despite his incredible intellect and achievements, he was absolutely willing to listen to whatever his young and inexperienced law clerk had to say and to consider it seriously, which is not to say that I changed his mind. Uh, he usually explained instantly, without any rancor, but quite incisively, why he was unpersuaded. But that open-mindedness and intellectual generosity is part of what makes Judge Posner so remarkable, as I think you will see. I'm honored to present Judge Richard Posner. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carolyn. Very gracious introduction and very pleased to be here. So my assigned topic is um, public intellectual activity by Supreme Court justices, but I'm going to expand it in, in uh, one direction. I'm going to also talk about um, the Supreme Court justices' behavior at uh, oral argument. Because that's a kind of a parallel phenomenon, closely related to their public intellectual activities, could even be regarded as, uh, as a part of them. So I'm going to talk about how their public intellectual and uh, questioning activities have changed over the last half century. And I'm going to offer some reasons for why uh, th there has been this change, and also uh, explains what I think is the dynamic of such changes. And then I'll give reasons for the, oh, I said that. I'm giving you reasons for the change, yes, and the dynamic. And then I'm going to talk a little about the uh, consequences. So a half century is convenient. <laughs> It's not only a round number, it happens to be 50 years ago that I clerked uh, on the Supreme Court. And then a few years after that, I, I, I was in the Solicitor General's office. So I'm pretty familiar with the way the Supreme Court operated in the early 1960s. And it is quite different from, from today. So the Supreme Court justices uh, were very quiet. <laughs> in the early days. They didn't ask many questions at oral argument at all. And they also didn't engage in public intellectual activities. They were, they were cloistered. They were quiet. They, this, of course, was the Warren Court, and it was very active. It was controversial. But uh, the justices did not spend, uh, they, they really were not public figures except for, well, Warren, some extent because of Brown versus Board of Education, because he was the Chief Justice, he was well known. Uh, and Justice Douglas, he was the only colorful figure on the Supreme Court. And he, of course, he wrote a lot that unrelated to law about environment and so on. And he also had his uh, irregular personal life. So he was an object of some interest <laughs> of the public, but generally not. So they were sort of wallflowers. And, um, uh, now, historically, the, this, was the, this was the general character of the Supreme Court justices, except when the court was embattled. And then they would step forward occasionally. So it was a famous example, the Hughes-Brandeis letter to Congress in 1937, criticizing the uh, Roosevelt's court packing plan. That was a quite dramatic intervention in a, uh, in a congressional presidential uh, struggle. But that, that was rare. And uh, even though the Warren Court was very controversial, they, they, I don't think the justices felt any sense of embattlement or any need to somehow get outside the court and make their case. Um, so how have, how have things uh, changed? Well, now, of course, the Supreme Court justices are both very voluble at oral argument, extraordinarily so, so that the lawyers can barely get a word in edgewise. But also, they're very much involved in uh, public intellectual activities, whether it's presiding at moot courts or conducting mock trials of historical or fictional personages, or um, writing books and... Um, 
So the, these, are, these are the changes over 50 years. Now, unfortunately, we don't have really good records of this sort of thing. We only have transcripts of oral arguments of the Supreme Court since 1974, and I mean 1979, and the identification of the justice who's asking a question, that's, that, those records begin in 1984. And we don't really have good records of public intellectual activities, justices. They do, you know, they do give reports of their outside activities. I don't know. So, but it's not complete and it's not detailed. So I don't know a lot. But I think, so I don't know when the, um, I, I don't know the real sort of gradient of these public intellectual activities. Uh, they have become very, extensive now. I don't know really how recent it was. I do know, for example, though, showing the difference. So Justice Brennan um, had said when asked about his relations with the press, this was early in his career, in his Supreme Court career, he had, his, his reply was that uh, he never, he would never um, uh, meet a, a journalist in any place, at any time, on any subject. But in the 80s, when the Reagan administration, particularly uh, Ed Meese, was uh, criticizing the Supreme Court as insufficiently conservative, um, uh, then, then Brennan changed his view and, and engaged in a series of you know, interviews and television and other activities designed to present his, his side of the, uh, of the issue. But I think that after that, so that's the 80s, but I don't think there was too much activity for some time, but it's really mushroomed in the last, in the last few years. And of course, just in the last couple of years, it's ju uh, since Justice Souter, although he was quite voluble in the, in the Supreme Court's oral arguments, he didn't engage in any public intellectual activities outside. He was, he was a wallflower. So, um, but now he's been replaced by Justice Kagan, who's very active. So, um, so they all, all nine of them engaged in public intellectual activities and all but Justice Thomas are very talkative during the oral arguments. Now why, why would there be um, an increase in these, I say parallel activities, public intellectual and volubility at oral argument? And, um, there, there are, I think, three reasons. One is, and it's a general phenomenon of public intellectual activity, there's just much greater access to the media. There's no more gatekeeping <laughs> by newspapers and magazines. You know, you, you, can, you, can became, you can become famous, you can post a, a cat video on, you can upload it to YouTube and become, a celebrity, you know, in, in a matter of seconds. So, uh, and of course what's happened is because the, the range, uh, the, the media, if it's defined, you know, realistically and takes in the internet and not just, you know, newspapers and magazines, um, it, it's, it's vastly increased, the media are vastly increased and that means that they have desperate uh, a, a need for content. They have this vast, supply of, of um, air time and, you know, how do they fill it up? Um, and so they, they court, any, any person has some celebrity potential will be courted and, um, uh, and you know, they'll, they'll, have, they'll, they'll, be, they'll have no difficulty in getting an outlet, which wasn't always the case, of course. So that's one thing, the greater access to the media. A second is that the cost of public intellectual activity by Supreme Court justices has fallen because they have a lot more time on their hands. Man, I probably shouldn't say this when it's being recorded, but, but um, so when I was a law clerk, the olden days, 1962, the Supreme Court was deciding about twice as many uh, cases, you know, orally argued and full opinion, as it is today, about 150. That was the first thing. The staff was much more limited, so there were only two law clerks instead of four. 
But the quality difference was also dramatic because um, it's hard to... It's, it's hard to believe that in this day of, you know, the $280,000 signing bonus for Supreme Court law clerks. But not only there were no signing bonuses, but a Supreme Court law clerk, a Supreme Court clerkship was actually not that big a deal. Um, there weren't many applications. Uh, there were no particular standards. Um, <laughs> There was a kind, a certain amount of nepotism, not in the literal sense, but, but often a, um, well, it was a kind of nepotism because very often the justices, the justice would delegate the selection of the law clerk. It might be to a personal friend, it might be to some professional acquaintance, professor that that was friendly with, something like that. And of course, these people would tend to, I don't know if they actually would propose their children as law clerks, but you know, it would be a protege or something of that sort. Um, there was no tradition of, of that, that law clerks, Supreme Court law clerks had already served a clerkship for, so that sometimes happened, but it wasn't, it wasn't the, uh, there wasn't any kind of norm. Um, there were no interviews with Supreme Court justice. It was all very casual. And so the, the quality of Supreme Court staff has uh, increased. So here's the Supreme Court. And then, of course, the cert pool um, actually freed up a lot of, a lot of law clerk time uh, so they could spend more time on the smaller number of opinions. Um, so what that means is a much higher ratio, especially quality adjusted, much higher ratio of staff time to judicial opinions. Um, and of course, these are very eager and aggressive people, these law clerks. So the, the, the almost kind of pressure on Supreme Court justices to delegate more and more work to the, to the law clerks is a, that, that would be an expectable consequence of expansion of staff. You, know, you expand staff and you reduce the caseload, you're going to have um, a lot more uh, assistance, and that means it's going to free up your time as a Supreme Court judge. You're going to have more time. So more time for travel, public intellectual activities, writing books, whatever it is you, you like to do. So the costs the opportunity costs of being a public intellectual as a Supreme Court justice um, have fallen, and I think that's a, a factor also. There are also some financial opportunities, um, book deals with, with big advances. That's, that has not been important to many of them, but has you know, several, several of them have written sort of semi-popular books, um, O'Connor and uh, Rehnquist, so, um, so as I say, access to the media, the opportunity to be a celebrity and have your name in the papers and on, on the screen and so on, that's attractive to people. People like to be, to be lionized. And the cost of this activity and time foregone from your judicial work, that's fallen. There are some financial benefits. So it's not surprising that there should have been the increase in this um, uh, public intellectual activity. Now, that doesn't explain why there is so much volu more volubility at oral argument. One possibility is since they have fewer cases and they have better staff, they should be better prepared at oral argument. And the better prepared they are, the more confident they can be about being able to ask questions without, um, without uh, embarrassing themselves. Uh, but also, the, uh, the oral arguments are publicized, in, in the, they are described in the newspapers, and um, even though they're not, they're not video, and it's occasionally recorded now, and, and the recordings are, are played in public. But, 
Uh, it is an there is, is, is some opportunity for Supreme Court justices by the questions they ask at oral argument to have to obtain an audience outside of the uh, legal community. So it's a way of, it's kind of public intellectual work. Now there's another fact, I said I wanted to describe the dynamic of this, of this process. I think it's very interesting. So um, you, all, you all know what an equilibrium is. And often the same system has multiple equilibria. So for example, H2O, right, can be a gas, can be a liquid, can be a solid. And it's a, it's a, it's a characteristic often of these multiple equilibria that the changes are very, very abrupt. Um, at 211 degrees, water doesn't, doesn't turn, uh, H2O doesn't turn into gas, but at 212 it does. So um, a small change can, can have a dramatic effect. So I can see two equilibria of Supreme Court justices with regard both to volubility at oral argument and uh, um, public intellectual activity. One is not doing it, <laughs> being quiet and not engaged in public intellectual activity, just being a wallflower. And if they're all like that, that's fine. That's the way the Supreme Court has been uh, uh, most of the time historically. So that's fine. That's, I say, it's, a, it's stable, it's an equilibrium. The other equilibrium is uh, everybody talking and everybody doing public intellectual activities. And the, the way in which this, the, the equilibrium can change uh, is that, s suppose you have one justice very voluble, and I think Justice Frankfurter was like that, and the rest are quiet. Well, that's all right, this is one outlier, you know. But suppose now you have two or three who are talking a lot at oral argument. Now the others, they get kind of uncomfortable, right? Because now they're feeling, well, look, the public is going to think they're these smart guys who ask questions, and the rest of us sitting there like dumbbells, right? Probably don't understand what's going on. And similarly, if some of the justices start going out and appearing on talk shows and they're being written about and writing books and articles and what have you, then the others feel kind of wallflowers, you know, no one's interested in, in them. <laughs> They're not, they're not, they don't have any audience outside the, the people in the Supreme Court chambers. They get uncomfortable. So, um, you, so once a few start changing, you can, you, you, the, the change can then become very rapid. It's what, it's what scientists would call a phase transition. You have a very rapid change from one equilibrium uh, to, to another as if... Uh, and I think, I think that's happened to a considerable extent. So in the case, in the volubility side, of course, Justice Thomas is an outlier because uh, he doesn't ask questions or anything at all. But all the others now are very active talkers. Um, and then in public intellectual activity, all of them are on the circuit uh, involved in various sorts of public intellectual activity, all nine of them. And that, as I say, I think that's a, a, a pretty stable e equilibrium, unless, you know, President were to appoint a bunch of introverts, right, like Justice Souter. If you picked a few people like that, you might find the equilibrium swing, swinging back. Um, So let me say something about the, is, are these good developments or bad developments? I think they're bad, but also totally inconsequential. <laughs> um, they're bad because, because all the talk, all the jabber at the oral argument is really silly. Um, the lawyers don't get to say anything or very little. And the justice is sort of, there's a lot of clowning, and it's undignified, right?
But there's no more dignity in American public life. So that's why I say it's inconsequential. Um, I have stronger objections to the public intellectual act. I think it's kind of scandalous, uh, much of it, not all of it. But um, again, there's, also, there's a dignity fact. The Wall Street Journal had a front page picture a couple of years ago of Justice Ginsburg wearing a Civil War, post-Civil War a uniform because she was presiding at a posthumous court-martial of George Custer for having blown the Battle of the Little Bighorn. That seemed to me undignified and preposterous, actually. But um, again, you know, nobody cares about, about dignity. But <laughs> what I do think is really objectionable, I strongly object to that, is to this, is, oh, another thing that I approve of, just to show I'm not, I'm not um, entirely uh, sourpuss. But uh, how many of you saw Justice Sotomayor's appearance on Sesame Street? Oh, a lot. Oh, great. Well, I thought that was fine, right? So if you describe it in words, so to speak, sound, sounds a little dubious because she was adjudicating a dispute between two stuffed animals. <laughs> but, you know, this is for children, and, it was, and she's very, even very good natured. It was, it was fine. So I have absolutely no objection to something like that. There, there was no pretense that it was the... Uh, some serious intellectual venture. On the other hand, what I, what I really don't like is, I'm not sure how much extends to <laughs> poor old Custer, but I strongly disagree, I strongly um, disapprove of uh, mock trials of historical and fictitious characters and of historical controversy. So, starting with the last, so the Supreme Court Justice, I think not all of them, but several of them, I know includes Justice uh, Stevens, have conducted trials of whether Shakespeare was the actual author of Shakespearean plays or whether it was the Earl of Oxford. Well, you know, this is crank stuff. This is flying saucers, you know, <laughs> flat earth, only nuts. I doubt Shakespeare's authorship. But we now have Justice Stevens and one other Supreme Court justice, maybe in Rehnquist, who are on record as saying they believe Shakespeare was not the author of his plays. Now, for, for, first of all, they have no competence to opine on such an issue. That's an issue for, uh, for you know, Renaissance historians and literary critics literary scholars, it's not for judges. And when, the, when judges start going completely in, into areas about which they know nothing, um, they're, they're giving a, uh, uh, they're conveying a, or creating a bad impression of the judiciary. I say it's, it's inconsequential, no one's paying attention, except me, right? <laughs> <clears throat> so they do that. There have been trials, you know, was Richard III really responsible for the killing the little princes? <laughs> and uh, uh, and there, is, there is actually a lot of historical controversy over how bad was Richard III and uh, how deformed was he. And, you know, just recently, if, you, if you've noticed, they have found what they, in England, in, the, you know, construction, excavation, they found what they thought was his uh, skeleton, and in fact, there was a deformity of his spine, scoliosis, probably not as serious as he's portrayed by Shakespeare and Richard III, because this is all part of Tudor Plantagenet rivalry. But um, so there is a lively historical controversy. But the but the judges, the just, they are they're in no position to opine on that. It doesn't create a good impression when, because you're a prominent in one field, you start offering irresponsible opinions in, in, an un, in another field. I mean, these, this is not Donald Trump, but this is, you know, the same sort of thing. You're successful in one thing. You think, well, I'm omniscient. I, I, I can have an opinion on anything which is worth listening to. And then you have uh, 
for example, um, I think Justice Kennedy presided at a trial of, and this I think was in the Hollywood Bowl, but some huge you know, trial of Hamlet for murder, uh, murder of Polonius, with a defense of insanity. And, eh, ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> and especially if you, know, if you know Hamlet, you realize that, um, that Hamlet, Hamlet kills Polonius, thinking that Polonius is Claudius, whom he wants to kill. There's nothing insane about that. He thinks Claudius killed his father. He wants to kill Claudius. He just makes a mistake. So whatever mental problems he displays at other parts of the play are not, not engaged here. But, any, but, but, the real pro, but the real objection to this sort of thing, apart from just the, the unprofessionalism of venture, is it's a misunderstanding of the trial, right? So you don't, we don't use trials to determine historical uh, truth. That's, that, we don't do that, and because if you think about it, uh, there are a lot of aspects of trials which are designed to, uh, uh, which compromise the truth-seeking function because of other values, right? Like, um, uh, there are privacy values. There are concerns about, you know, also evidence that should not be admitted because, because it violates laws. So trials are very artificial ways of, of discovering truth. They may be able to do a pretty good job just, uh, dealing with contemporary issues, but they're not a rational vehicle for trying to determine historical questions. So the justices who engage in this stuff, they're perpetuating uh, a, a, uh, a misconception of the role of a trial in relation to uh, truth-seeking. But as I say, I don't think these, uh, so I, I don't like this stuff, but I, don't, I, I, think, it is, um, I think it is inconsequential. Um, there's, there's concern, just a paper actually given yesterday at University of Chicago about threats to the legitimacy of the uh, judiciary. A lot of talk about legitimacy, and um, I, don't, I, think that's, I think that's misunderstood. It is true, this is a this is Max Weber on legitimacy, it is true that there has to be some general popular acceptance of the basic political institutions of society, or else you can have profound instability. But that doesn't, that mustn't be confused with having a high regard for particular political institutions or their personnel. So if you, if you think of Congress, which has like, what, a 12 or 14 percent uh, approval rating, but no one says, oh, well, Congress uh, better watch out, you know, has a low approval rating. Doubts about its legitimacy. Maybe, maybe people are going to start proposing we abolish Congress. You know, um, no, there's no. They don't feel any threat, and there isn't any threat. Well, but it's. I don't think the courts are any different. Um, it doesn't matter whether people like the Supreme Court justices or don't like them or know who they are. Actually, recognition of Supreme Court justices is extraordinarily low. Um, for many years, the only one who was above, like, you know, five or six percent recognition was Justice O'Connor because she was the only woman. So they could, you know, fasten on that. But um, generally, even, you know, someone very prominent in our circles, like Justice Scalia, I think only has about a five percent recognition rate. So uh, and many people, if you ask them how decisions are, are arrived at by courts, they'll have all sorts of unflattering explanations, like politics, connections, this, that, mistake, what have you. But that doesn't damage the, the, the courts. It doesn't undermine them in any significant way. They, their decisions are still obeyed, more or less. And they meet out sanctions, which are enforced by the executive branch, and they're treated uh, politely by the um, 
by the legislative branches and by the states and so on. So I don't, I don't think there's a legitimacy issue with the Supreme Court. That's why even if I or others d don't don't think that their that their public intellectual activities and their behavior oral argument uh, casts a, a good light on the court, on the justices, it, it has no consequences for it. So they're having a good time, they have time, <laughs> they have a good time, something to make some money out of it. So they're happy, which is fine. And uh, they're, not hurt, you know, they're not hurting the institution, even though one can uh, uh, criticize them if one is, is a fuss pot. Well, that's really all I have to say. So, so, so Professor Shapiro and I are going to have a, a little uh, question answer with, with your questions. Thank you. And I think that I think that people should have cards that the law review editors and staff may be collecting. But if not, we'll call on people. Um, so I have a question to start with, uh, which is, given your criticisms of the justices for their, for engaging in, in talking about things that they perhaps aren't expert in, how do you think about what to talk about uh, when you write books or articles? And do you worry about whether or not uh, it's appropriate for you to talk about certain subjects as the sitting federal judge, whether from the perspective of controversies that might come before you or from the perspective of what's sort of dignified and appropriate? <laughs> um, uh, I don't think, um, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with judges, justices, um, who have time, you know, writing about issues that are that, that they really know about, right? And uh, although you mentioned all the books I've written, suggesting how could I, how could I uh, know about these things I write about? But you know, these academic works, I've spent time on them, feel comfortable with them. Um, it's it's never gotten me into trouble actually with the litigants. Um, the only time I was. The only time I think I was ever asked to recuse myself was on the basis of some work I'd done for um, a party in what I thought was an unrelated case, but the, the litigant was wroth about it. Um, I recused myself occasionally because, you know, um, might be someone from the University of Chicago who might, might be an expert witness whom I knew personally. So occasional recusals. I can't sit in a case where the University of Chicago is a party and so on. But never uh, have I you know, felt that because I maybe written about some subject, um, I wasn't, uh, I, should, I shouldn't sit. And after all, the, the, lit the lawyers must know that the judges are bringing to the case a lot of knowledge that, that isn't in the briefs, right? So the more, in a way, the more the judges and justices explain their views, values, so on, what they're interested in, that, that ought to help lawyers in as any cases to them. Well, we have questions on all kinds of different subjects here, not just okay. on what you spoke about. But this one, I think, will be useful to many people here. What advice would you give to a young attorney arguing for the first time in front of the Seventh Circuit? Oh, that's, that, it's very easy to answer the question, but somehow it, the answers don't stick. So, <laughs> so the first, what you have to do, the most important, th well, I'll take the second, the, the less important is that you, you ought to have a rehearsal in front of, lawyers, professors, what have you, who are not experts in the subject matter of your case. That's essential, right? Because the judges aren't experts. So you, if, if you have a, pa a rehearsal panel 
of non-experts, that you are more likely to get the kind of questions uh, you'll get from judges. Not only get the kind of questions, but you'll also learn what it is about the case that's puzzling to a, a non-specialist. So but the more important thing, which I, I, lawyers, I don't understand it, but they're really bad at that. You have to imagine what it is like to be a judge, right? Anytime you talk to an audience, talk to anybody, you have to have a sense of what that person is like, interest, comprehension, and so on. So if you just think about the judges, our court, um, pretty heavy caseload, not crushing or anything, but pretty heavy caseload, um, scattered across the whole of federal jurisdiction, but also state because of the diversity jurisdiction and the supplemental jurisdiction. Uh, in some areas, like um, um, criminal sentencing, the judges tend to know a lot because, um, uh, because they have a, we have a lot of cases. Although even there, you know, the sentencing guidelines are very complicated. So. Um, and, um, you know, drug case, get a lot of drug cases. So the judges tend to, you know, be pretty good about evidence, things like that. But if it's a case involving some complicated financial transaction or some complicated regulatory program, uh, the judges are going to be at sea. So, so you have to think, assume the judge doesn't know anything about this. How do I explain it? I had a case uh, several years ago involved the Telecommunications Act of 1993. And I actually used to know, I mean, Carolyn mentioned that I was on a, a telecommunications task force of President Johnson's administration. So I used to know a lot about telecommunications. But that was a long time ago, and I didn't know anything about the Telecommunications Act of 1993. But I, you know, I read the briefs, didn't understand. My law clerks read them, didn't understand the case. <laughs> so at the argument, I said to one of the lawyers, I said, Look, I read your briefs, the law clerks read your briefs. None of us understand what this case is about. So would you describe it to us in words of one syllable? <laughs> so the lawyer was taken aback, right? Judges don't usually talk that way. But he was a very good lawyer. And he explained the case in words of one syllable. And it was perfectly intelligible. The problem was that uh, telecommunications lawyers appear most of the time before the Federal Communications Commission. So there's specialists talking to specialists, not to generalists. But as I say, when you're preparing for an argument in the Seventh Circuit, you're, you're, you're going to be talking to generalists. Um, and even if it's a drug case or a criminal case, you know, we're getting all sorts of, of issues arising from modern surveillance technology, right? Um, DNA evidence, and uh, there, uh, there's much more question of fingerprint evidence now, and uh, all these tracking programs, and this and that and the other. So even the criminal cases have become, off, become often very complex. So I... I Maybe some lawyers feel that we, w we, would, we would think they were patronizing us if they explained things in very simple words. But I've never had that reaction, either myself or from another judge. We, ne we never say, well, those lawyers, they must think we're really dumb, because they just they explain their case on a kindergarten level. No, no, the judges are grateful when the lawyers explain things very, very simply. Um, and you know, the judges, um, they are much less legalistic than lawyers believe. Um, you know, we don't want to upset the apple cart completely. We don't want to ignore statutes and uh, precedents and so on. But uh, there, there's a strong um, impulse, sense of, by judges that really trying to, the judge is trying to find a reasonable outcome, a sensible outcome. 
within a framework established by, um, you know, authoritative texts, statutes, regulations, precedents, and so on. They, they want to do that. But it's different from showing them that the sensible course is not blocked by these materials and trying to hit them over the head with the materials. You know, among the many phrases I would love to see banished from the legal vocabulary, my first choice would be plain meaning. <laughs> because when does one read a brief in which the term plain meaning does not uh, and usually both sides argue plain meaning. They only do it when they're dealing with an ambiguous document. <laughs> so it's, it's it, it, totally empty rhetoric. Totally empty rhetoric. Um, but, but nothing I say on that score, or if all the judges in the country got together and said, we don't want to hear about plain meaning. Wouldn't have the slightest effect. It's too deep in the <laughs> genetic material of advocates. I, I'll just add two observations from watching you at work. One is you like it when people actually tell you a story in the in your in their briefs, as opposed to just throwing together apparently unrelated facts. Um, and you really, really don't like it when people won't answer your questions. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm not really very nice to them. So, <laughs> no, I've taken to, I, I've taken to telling lawyers, look, if the question can be answered yes or no, answer it yes or no, and then if you have to explain your answer, fine. Um, the, the other thing that gets me is, um, so a judge will ask the question, and it's at the end of the argument, the red light goes on signifying the end of the advocate's time. And then, invariably, the lawyer will say, Can, may I answer your question? Which is so ridiculous, because the, the judge has asked a question. Then the red light went on. So is the judge going to say, well, I would have liked an answer to my question. <laughs> That's why I asked it. But the red light is going <laughs> So I think if, if lawyers used it, it's in common sense, they thought, OK, so suppose they said to themselves, now what if, what if the judge asked me a question and the red light goes on? What should I do? And then they think about it. Well, what would I do if I were the judge? Would I want, want the lawyer to answer the question, or would I want the lawyer to sit down and ignore my question? And if you thought, that, I think it would occur to you immediately that the judge wants the question answered. So um, recently, you've been in the news a lot because of your spat with Justice Scalia. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess one question is, what made you decide to be as critical as you were about his book in your original review of it? And then what do you think about what happened next? Did you expect what happened next? What are your thoughts about it? Well, I was just asked, I, I was very innocent. I was just asked by the <laughs> li literary editor of the New Republic to uh, review his book. I'd already been asked and agreed to review a, a book by Akhil Amar called The Unwritten Constitution. And um, so I thought, OK, that was, the, that was the left. Now I'd see what the right has to say about this. And I read the, I read the, I read the book. and. Um, and what, what got me, I'm reading along, and I'm reading along, and they describe a case in which they said that a court, it was the Supreme Court of Kansas in the 70s, had held that roosters are not birds. And Scalia and Garner, they're very critical of this, because they say, you just look in a dictionary, you'll see a rooster is a bird. And I said to myself, looking at that, could a court have actually said that roosters are not birds? So I looked, I looked up the opinion, because what they had cited. And what the Supreme Court of Kansas, oh, so the issue was um, whether cockfighting in Kansas violated the state law which forbade cruel mistreatment of animals. 
And the court had held no. And according to Scalia and Garner, the holding was that roosters are not birds. So they have, roosters are, and I'm wrong, sorry. What they said was that the Kansas court had held roosters are not animals. That's what it held. And therefore, cockfighting didn't violate the law against cruel mistreatment of animals. And I said to myself, could a court really have said, outside the Deep South maybe, could a court really have said, <laughs> roosters are not animals? So I read the opinion. So what the, so what the court actually said was, uh, biologically, of course, roosters are animals. But a lot of people in Kansas, I'm paraphrasing, but this is actually what they meant, what they're driving. A lot of people in Kansas, apparently, if you ask uh, a, a person whether a rooster is, a, is an animal, the reply will be, no, it's a bird. So apparently in Kansas, people distinguish between birds <laughs> and animals. But then the court went on to give what I thought was a really good reason why cockfighting is legal in Kansas. And that is that the legislature had passed a law which said cockfighting is illegal on Sunday, right? So it's a strong implication it was legal every other day of the week. <laughs> and then the legislature, a few years later, repealed that law. So now cockfighting is legal on Sunday, too. So, <laughs> and the, ju the judges of the Supreme Court of Kansas, they were embarrassed because they made very clear they thought cockfighting was really disgusting. But they felt, you know, partly because of this uh, kind of strange um, way in which a lot of Kansas people talk and the, the law about the uh, Sunday cockfighting, that they felt, you know, that, that cockfighting was not within the scope of the cruelty to animals law. I thought it was a perfectly good decision. So to criticize them for not knowing the dictionary meaning of roosters struck me as, as, as really a distortion. And then, so then I started reading the other opinions that they cited, and I found what I thought were really a large number of mistakes. So for that and other reasons, I, I wrote a critical review. I, 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 Highly critical review. <laughs> yeah, it was critical. I, I, I thought it was... Uh, I think it was not a good book. I was equally critical of Akhil Amar's book on the unwritten constitution. I'm reading along. I get to page three. I discover <laughs> there are 11 unwritten constitutions. That floored me, each of which is of equal dignity with the written constitution. So that, that was something. Well, a very well-written book. He's very smart. He knows a lot about constitutional history, but I thought pretty, pretty goofy. So, <laughs> but, um, well. Were you surprised at all by Justice Scalia's reaction? Well, I didn't like it when he said that I had told a lie <laughs> when I said that um, legislative history was not limited to the drafting history of a, of a statute. So you have drafting history which would be the actual uh, uh, bills proposed and the hearings on them and the conference and the you know, committee reports. That's the drafting history. So she said it was a lie to suggest that legislative history can, can, it can have, a, have a broader meaning. So I looked this up in Black's Law Dictionary, <laughs> which is edited by his co-author, Garner, Brian Garner. And his definition is legislative history is the events and circumstances giving rise to a statute, including committee reports, hearings, and so on. So clearly it's a broader concept. And the example I like to give is, you know, the cruel and unusual punishments clause in uh, the Eighth Amendment is lifted verbatim from the English Bill of Rights of 1689. So that's, you know, 100 years earlier. 
And yet, most people, I think, would say that the English Bill of Rights provision about cruel and unusual punishments is part of the legislative history of the, um, of the Eighth Amendment, because the Eighth Amendment was based on English legal experience and Blackstone, and Blackstone, obviously, influenced by the English Bill of Rights. Um, I was speaking specifically about the, the background of the, uh, of the Second Amendment, right? The Second Amendment didn't just appear in, uh, in the Bill of Rights, you know, 70, ratified in 1791. Um, there was a long history of discussion in England and the United States about the right to keep and bear arms. That seemed to me part of the legislative history, even though it wasn't part of the actual drafting history. So I thought calling and saying it was a lie was a little strong. But also, even if I was even if I were wrong, that wouldn't mean a lie, right? That would have to be a deliberate, <laughs> a deliberate falsehood. But I'm not suing for lying. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my, the last question it has to do with the politicization of the court and whether you think that is either a cause or an effect of the sort of public intellectual and volubility at oral argument that we see among the justices, and, how you, and whether you think there's a relationship with how quiet people are when they're being hoping to be considered for nomination to the Supreme Court, where they say virtually nothing, and once they're on the bench, suddenly they have all kinds of <laughs> things to say. Well, of course, the, uh, I mean, the reality is that the Supreme Court, not in all of its cases, but um, in most of the constitutional cases and plenty of the other cases as well. It's really a political court. And, um, but you can't have, you know, the, the ritual of the confirmation hearing, it doesn't permit people to say that, you know, of course, I mean, what, the, what, what they could say was, look, the, the Constitution, most of it, well, some of it is, you know, 225 or so years old. The 14th Amendment, that's 144 years old. Those are the major amendments, those are the major provisions. And um, the, these were drafted in, a, in often in rather vague terms by people who lived in a completely different culture from ours. And um, it's absurd to think that you can be literal minded about these things. So, so the, the judges, that's true with a lot of statutes, the Sherman Act, uh, 1890, completely different uh, commercial world and completely different understanding of economics and monopoly and so on. Uh, so the Sherman Act has been totally transformed by the courts on the basis of modern economic understandings. And the Constitution, really Constitution law is made by the Supreme Court. Not, it's not in the Constitution. It's a free interpretation of the Constitution. So that's the reality. But um, anyone who, who says that is disqualified from being considered because you know, you're supposed to say what Justice Roberts said, that the Supreme Court justices are umpires. They just call ball and strikes. They don't balls and strikes. They don't bat or pitch. And that's uh, and that you know is sort of reassuring. That's what people would like to think, but it's uh, it's it's not it's not it's not realistic. And uh, every everyone who's knowledgeable knows it's not realistic, but doesn't seem to matter at all. I mean, well, thank you very much. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you.